Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our ninth webinar in our series of Friday afternoon webinars. I'm excited to join uh, for you to join us today for this ex interesting and uh, innovative topic on DM2. Before we get started, I just wanted to remind you of a few quick things. Uh, just to let you know who we are, if you not, are not already aware, the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation, also known as Myotonic, we're a nonprofit organization founded in 2007 by families looking for support, resources, and a cure. Our mission is Care and a Cure, which is to enhance the quality of life of people living with myotonic dystrophy and accelerate research focused on finding treatments and a cure. Our work focuses on support, education, research, and advocacy. We have a, lot, a variety of resources and support re options for you. You can check out our website. Our toolkits and publications page shows a lot of the resources that we have available for downloading and for ordering hard copies. We have virtual support groups and Facebook chats that you can find information about on our Find Support page. Our calendar act of activities lists all of our upcoming groups and events, and you can look at that on our website at uh, the calendar page. And we also have our digital academy, which has information about um, symptom management and other topics from past presentations and conferences and events. And you can find that information on our digital academy page. Just to remind you about our resources that we have available now, in addition to all, a lot of the resources we have, these are two new resources to know about. Our guide to navigating the employment process for people living with myotonic dystrophy. This is a comprehensive toolkit that helps individuals explore and navigate the employment process, figure out how to apply for a job, help you with your cover letter, applying ideas for interviewing and much more. You can download this, this toolkit on the website or you can request a hard copy by going to our website. Our other new resource is the Health Insurance Guide for People Living with Myotonic Dystrophy in the United States. This resource guide helps navigate the process of making sure your medical treatments and medications are covered and helps you understand how to appeal your claims if they are denied. This is a great guide for helping you to advocate for your care and delivery of resources and your health systems. You can download this guide at our uh, website and you can see on the screen the toolkits and publications page where you can download. Just a quick reminder about our DM Family Registry. If you're not already enrolled, please consider enrolling at the link on the screen. This is a great effort which will help, help people with diatonic dystrophy and researchers understand more about the disease by joining efforts. It's a database that helps researchers find new effective treatments and identify possible um, participants for upcoming clinical trials and research studies. Anyone can join the database who has DM um, and you can have access to the data once you're registered. So you can find more information about that on the link on the screen. And uh, if you have questions about that, we can help you as well. Uh, feel free to email us at info at myotonic.org. So uh, we have one more webinar coming up next Friday, our last in our 10 part series. Um, next Friday, June 19th, we have the Myotonic Dystrophy and the Brain webinar causes effects and treatments. You can also see a variety of our past webinars from the past nine weeks listed at the past webinars page on the screen. There we have all the recordings and slides posted on our website at this time. So we encourage you to explore these past webinars on these different great topics. And um, if you haven't already listened, maybe um, think about listening and learning more about these topics. So just a quick plug for next Friday, our last webinar, last but not least, this will be a very, very comprehensive and exciting webinar on myotonic dystrophy and the brain causes effects and treatments. You can register at the link on the screen. It will be presented by a variety of clinicians, doctors at um, Stanford University, and it's going to focus on how myotonic is related to anything in the, on the cognitive side. So mental fatigue, daytime sleepiness, and brain fog, but um, really focusing more on the underlying um, uh, genetic changes and, and new research and innovative strategies that the researchers are using to target these areas, including drug trials and other potential treatments. So this will be a really exciting and a new topic for us. So please consider uh, enrolling and joining us next Friday for our last webinar of the series. And last, um, just to, to, if you haven't already heard about our My Gratitude project, we hope that you can send us a photo of yourself with the hashtag MyGratitude. Please send that to us at development at myatonic.org. 
You can see on the screen here, there's a variety of photos of staff and community members who have um, sent us their photos for this project. And so we will hope you can join us and, and show us what you're grateful for during this time. And also we are, we've been um, holding a few different virtual chair yoga series since uh, the beginning of this month. And we have two more coming up this month on Mondays at 12 p.m. Pacific. You don't have to attend the entire series. If you'd like to just attend one or two, that's fine. So you can see the information on the screen and it's a free virtual chair yoga class um, sponsored, held, excuse me, on Zoom and um, uh, led by one of our great facilitators. Uh, Ellen Shapiro, who's very familiar and has worked with the community. So please um, join us if you haven't already. So on to today's webinar. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Giovanni Maiola today, a doctor from Italy, talking to us about the multi-systemic and cognitive aspects of myotonic dystrophy type 2. We have solicited questions already from the audience, but if you have other questions that have come up that will come up during the presentation, please send them via the chat box and we will request that our speaker address them over email. We've compiled a list of questions and sent them to him ahead of time. And so you should hopefully see your question answered if you submitted it uh, previously. So just wanted to let you know a little bit more about Dr. Mayola. He has been a frequent conference speaker at our Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation conferences and different conferences around the country. He's been a real key researcher in the DM2 field and been a great advocate and partner with us with working on different guidelines and resources for the entire community, but especially for the DM2 community. He's been uh, working in the neuromuscular field since 1975. He's an expert in the diagnosis and management of myotonic dystrophies and other non-dystrophic myotonias. He's the chairman of the Neuromuscular Center in Italy. Um, and he's a researcher who's developed a diagnosis of DM2 on bi muscle biopsy by fish and other uh, mechanisms. So as I said, he's been a great support for us and um, a great partner to have. So we're very lucky to have him today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mayola. Okay, okay. So, uh, uh, the, well, uh, this afternoon, uh, I will speak today about the multisystemic and the cognitive aspects of the myotonic dystrophy type 2. And uh, it is also a big, a big pleasure for me to, uh, to be a panelist in this webinar. Uh, so the, uh, the, the outline of my talk would, would be about the multisystemic aspects the Italian registry on DM1, DM2. Uh, I will speak about the patient's report survey. I will do an update on the cognitive deficits. Uh, I will talk about the neuropsychiatric features, the central nervous system imaging, coping with the COVID-19 and the DM2. And I will, I will talk about research. I will do an update about research. And uh, I will talk about uh, some care recommendation. And finally, I will take uh, uh, I will talk about the take-home message. Okay, uh, the multisystemic aspect. Uh, as you know, the myotonic dystrophy type two, the M two, called also PROM. Uh, the chromosome locus is uh, the chromosome three. And, um, and and also the gene in the Dinger thing nine, uh, the inheritance is autosomal dominant. The mechanism is due to a tetraplet, CCTG. And uh, we have the normal repeat size is less than 27. And the pathological repeat size is above 75. We, in, in all, in, in, in the DM2 patients, we have an expanded repeat range between 75 to 11,000 with a medium of 5,000. But what is very important and what is important and different from DM1, that in DM2, there is no anticipation at all. Uh, regarding the country-specific prevalence of, uh, of DM2 and also DM1, uh, as, um, as um, 
as you can see, the, uh, the, uh, is much more prevalent in the eastern part of, of Europe, mainly in the Czech Republic, but also in the north, in Finland, and in, uh, and, uh, in uh, Germany, there is the equal prevalence of the M1 and the M2. In Italy, we have uh, less uh, prevalence of the M2, is about one uh, of prevalence on uh, 100,000 in comparison to to the um, to the uh, DM1 where we are about 10 uh, or 11 on uh, on uh, 100,000 the origin of DM2 patient ancestor is in the eastern part of Europe mainly in the Silesia region uh, between Poland and Tseka. Uh, and you can see the slides, all the affected patients are red and the green are not affected. But you can see the, is, is the origin is mainly in the eastern part of, of Europe. Is a, a multisystemic uh, disease. As, um, as you can see, we, uh, we have uh, about 50% of cataract, um, 41 dyslipidemia, and 8% gallstone. The thyroid dysfunction is about 32%. The diabetes mellitus type 2 is 30%. And the affective disorders, and I will focus mainly uh, mainly on this uh, issue will be about the 21%, and the heart disease is about 19%. The, um, only 4% have a pacemaker and a defibrillator implanted, and 60% have a cardiomyopathy, and 16% arrhythmia. Regarding the respiratory impairment, only 13% have a uh, of this impairment, and they use non-invasive ventilation only in two in in two hundred percent. Regarding the involvement of muscle groups in the M2, as you can see, they are mainly involved with more than sixty percent in the neck muscle and the proximal muscle in the lower limbs, mm. and between thirty and sixty percent in the paraspinal and uh, lumbar muscle, and between 20 and 30% in the, uh, in the uh, deltoid biceps muscle, and only 15% in the distal muscle, both in the upper limbs and lower limbs. Uh, a small percentage of the M2, fortunately, need working air aids. Only 15% need a brace of canes, and only 90% uh, deambulator, and only 60% are confined in, in a chair. So the myotonic dystrophy, uh, there are some specific symptoms in the beginning, which are a prominent uh, uh, possible weakness, mainly in the lower limbs, proximal muscle atrophy. Another feature important is the calf hypertrophy, and some patients present also tremor. Usually, the onset is in the third for decade, and the mean uh, age of onset is about uh, 30 years. But the DM2 share some, uh, there is some uh, uh, myotonic dystrophy core pattern, which are shared with the DM1, which are myotonia, but I will speak a little bit much more later muscle weakness and atrophy, early cataract, cardiac arrhythmias, dilatative cardiomyopathy, cognitive dysfunction, less in comparison to the M1, hypersomnia, hypergamma GT, insulin resistance, testicular atrophy, frontal balding, hypogamma globinemia, and a big issue, 
uh, represented by muscle pain. If we, if we want to differentiate the DM2 uh, from DM1, the age, uh, the age of onset is in DM2 about 50, 40 years. Uh, there is, a, a, regarding the family history, a variability in symptoms with uh, no evidence of signs of symptoms in some patients, uh, like only pain or other patients uh, present uh, uh, weakness. Uh, for the general appearance, in some cases, uh, dysphagia. Regarding the weakness, is uh, mainly positive and axial. And, but the big issue is, is the myalgia, which is the predominant. The sleep disturbance is, is a central sleep apnea, and the central nervous system involvement could be frequent, and we will see later, we have some cohort of patients with a frequent involvement. Some patients, in some patients, we have only concentration problems, and another feature is the hearing impairment. Uh, regarding the, the myotonia, um, we can find the, myo, my, the myotonic uh, discharge by MG mainly in the proximal muscle. So it is very important to search in the proximal muscle, but it can be also absent. Now, I want to report the Italian registry, uh, which we have uh, about the M1 and the M2. This is uh, the Italian registry network, uh, uh, where, as you can see, uh, we have about 12 centers, and the headquarter is in Milan, where, where I work, uh, in the Polyclinic uh, San Donato. But you can see there are many centers to all Italy, Lombardy, uh, Toscany, uh, Rome region, uh, Naples, and also Sicily. Uh, in this uh, Italian registry, uh, we enrolled about six, 655 DM patients, 94% uh, DM1 and uh, uh, less DM2. In DM1, we had a preponderance of the male, and uh, in DM2, we have a predominance of female. Um, if we look at the, to the presenting symptoms in DM2, you can see we have a little bit of dysphagia, fatigue, but you see the pain is a very important condition, and also weakness and uh, those myotonia. Regarding the time lag, there is a, regarding the time lag of the diagnosis, as you can see, the age at onset was later in the M2, the age at diagnosis was later in the M2 in comparison to the M1, but also the time lag of the diagnosis was uh, later in the M2 in comparison to the M1, and was about six, seven years. Uh, I want also to report the uh, patient's report survey, which in my opinion could be uh, interesting for the uh, DM2 uh, community. This, uh, this is uh, uh, related to a Christopher project last year in, uh, in 2019 where uh, it were uh, were um, reported uh, some important uh, questionnaire from a congenital dm1 uh, dm the uh, congenital dm1 165 about 500 dm1 and also 200 dm2 in um, this in this um, uh, christopher project the, uh, the respondents were mainly 80% in the United States and 20% in Canada. Um, the symptom impact, as, as you can see, uh, about uh, some patients have symptoms with a major impact, some with a moderate, some have a, a refer symptom with a minor impact. 
and uh, you can see the difference of the incidental in impact of the DM2 in comparison to DM1 and also the congenital DM1. So uh, I uh, I want to report the main the main the much more important symptoms which are master H's and cramp, and as you can see. Uh, regarding the M2, the 20% uh, refer uh, a, a, a high impact, the 30% a, a medium impact, and uh, also 24% a lower uh, impact regarding master edges and cramps. But regarding the master pain, uh, this is very important. You can see that, the, that this um, that this symptom is much more frequent in the M2 in comparison to the M1, and uh, about 24% refer uh, as a, a higher impact, 25 medium impact, and 24 impact low impact, but only 7% refer no impact at all. So just a minor, uh, just a, a minor uh, cohort of patients. The fatigue. The fatigue is another important issue. About 30% refer uh, high impact, 33% medium impact, and 22% uh, low impact, and only 8% no, uh, refer no, no fatigue. The daytime sleepiness, always the compatible was uh, it was compared less in the M2 in comparison to the M1. And uh, you can see about 20% uh, uh, high impact, 26% uh, medium impact, and 28% uh, low impact. And only 10% refer no, uh, no uh, daytime, daytime sleep. Regarding the psychological cognitive symptoms, uh, as you can see, uh, there was a, a less impact, uh, less complaining in the M2 in comparison to the M1, but mainly to the congenital DM1, and only 7% uh, refer high impact, 14% medium impact, and 17 low impact. The difficulty concentration was almost the same DM2, DM1, but 10% uh, high impact, uh, about 18% medium impact, 25% uh, low impact. And the anxiety, it was uh, uh, less in DM2 in comparison to DM1, but it was referred to 10% high impact, 18% at uh, uh, medium impact, and 20% low impact. And also the uh, clinical syndrome of, of depression, 12% high impact, 16% at medium uh, impact, and 19% um, low impact. But you can see also some patients, they, the 13% did not refer um, um, symptom at all. Now, I want to uh, talk about uh, and uh, about the cognitive deficits, and just to show you, and also I will make an update on the cognitive deficits. The, regarding the, um, uh, first of all, I want also to emphasize this point that the M2 is also a brain disorder. In this paper, uh, we evaluated about 50 DM2 uh, uh, adult patients, and uh, and uh, we analyzed the five cognitive domains: visuospatial, executive, attention, memory, and also language. And as you can see from these slides, one third of the M2 patients are completely normal. This is an important point. So that means that uh, from a cognitive point of view, the M2 is really less affected in comparison to, uh, to the M1. And the only two-thirds of patients approximately uh, had one or two domains affected. So that means 
that in a DM2, we have clusters of cognitive impairment, which means that, that only some cognitive domains are affected, not all cognitive domains, like, for instance, in the, in the M1. In this very old paper, this, this is a paper, uh, this one paper, um, which uh, was a seminal paper, we examined 20 DM2 patients uh, and we found an alteration. So we were one of the first who uh, evaluate mainly the lobe from the, the low the frontal lobe function, and we found an alteration uh, mainly in the lobal front, for instance, the story recall score, of course, also in the M1. And so we found uh, this alteration. And also, in a, um, more la later, in another paper, we underwent into about 20 uh, the M2 patients. We, uh, we did a neuropsychological test, but we did also a neuropsychiatric interview and also SPECT, and we found um, uh, an alteration of the um, uh, at the neuropsychological uh, testing, uh, mainly uh, we found an avoidant personality uh, trait alteration, which was very important. Of course, uh, this uh, and and this avoidant trait was much more evident in PROM in the M2 in comparison to the M1. And, and uh, <clears throat> in this paper later, well, uh, on 22 DM2 patients, uh, it was a performance neuropsychological and also a structural brain magnetic resonance by uh, very sophisticated techniques. It was found uh, an alteration of the brain, mainly an evidence for the predominant white matter disease. But from a neuropsychological point of view, in this paper, it was uh, uh, evident an alteration of the focus and the attention of the interference. And uh, in another paper uh, on 16 adult M2 patients, it was found again um, uh, in this paper, uh, where uh, the author examined, uh, um, they did the neuropsychological test, they did, uh, they scored the depression, the daytime sleepiness, and they did a very sophisticated uh, MRI imaging by three Tesla. They found some cortical and subcortical gray and white matter atrophy, both in the M1 and the M2. And, as, and, and how you can see, uh, uh, all the alteration regarding attention, tonic alertness, uh, divided attention, uh, memory, were all altered in the M2. Uh, also, was, uh, this alteration was uh, less in comparison to the M1. It was also found in a, a relationship between the brain stem, which is a part of the uh, brain in the um, uh, uh, a brain, a, the part in the lower part of the brain. It was found a, a relationship between the brain stem volume and also the depression in both in the M1 but also in the M2. This is uh, uh, I, the only study uh, which we have in literature where we evaluated uh, the cognitive impairment in DM1 and DM2. That was the only longitudinal study where we did in, uh, in um, DM2 for a, for a period of seven years and where you uh, and uh, how you can see, the, there was a, a decrease of the uh, muscle strength in the M2, which was less evident in comparison to the M1, 
But what what it was very interesting, this was a very interesting point, we found at the follow-up an alteration uh, at the follow-up uh, of the seven years, an alteration of the uh, uh, of the language and also of the memory and also all uh, regarding the attention and, and the executive function. So in summary, in this in this study, which is the only longitudinal study of patients with a DM2 that provide natural history data on muscle and the brain disease, we, we found a slower progression of muscle weakness in DM2 uh, in comparison to DM1, which suggests a more favorable prognosis for patients with DM2. And also based on the on a small number of patients, and I think that this point should be confirmed in a large cohort of patients, our data, this is a very important point, confirm a selective progressive frontal lobe function. So the lobe involved for the attention. And this is very important, demonstrate that over time, there is no progression to additional area of cognition, as there is no progressive interference in activity day life, as we observe in patients with, with a dementia. So that means that in this study, we showed a selective involvement only of the frontal lobe with impairment of some cognitive function completely different from the dementia or Alzheimer disease. Regarding the personality trait, I want also to mention other paper where, uh, as you can see, uh, it was always in comparison from DM2, DM, DM2, DM1 patients. You can see also the difference in demographic, for instance, uh, much more DM2 patients are married in comparison to DM1. Um, and also, uh, you can see also an alteration of the attention, orientation, memory. But if we look at to the personality traits in DM2, it was confirmed that the avoidant uh, personality, but it was also found in this larger cohort of patients, a compulsive uh, personality trait and also a paranoid in the M2. And uh, regarding the clinical syndrome, it was uh, found an anxiety um, less evident in comparison to the M1, but also somatization. The conclusion of this study. Uh, um, uh, are important because uh, um, or confirmed the personality trait, but the uh, personality trait predominant, the compulsive trait was much more impatient with higher education and the paranoid impatient with lower education and the earlier age adopted. And the most clinical symptoms were anxiety and also somatization. Now, we are moving to the neuropsychiatric features. And I want to just for this aspect uh, talk about one important issue, which is the pain. The pain is a big issue which we have in our clinic during our neuromuscular clinic, mainly for the M2. In this cohort, uh, about uh, 40, in 44 DM2 patients, uh, these patients, they refer an usual pain in 86% and also an unusual pain. And the pain was referred mainly in the upper legs and in the lower legs. But I want to just emphasize that they use analgesic in a 50%. And the pain reduction was only present in 
the, the pain in this court was uh, mainly prevalent in the females and was mainly uh, correlated to the uh, domain of the weakness in the, of the quality of life, but also to the emotion domain of the quality of life. So if we like, so we can summarize that the female gender uh, are, are, are much more pain in the M2, and that there is a relationship to the weakness of the quality of life and the emotional quality of life. So in this M2 court patients, there is a strong association of pain severity with the female gender in the quality of life weakness and in quality of life emotion. Depression is more common in the M2 patients and it's possible that the DM2 patients are more depressed because of somatic pain. It, I think, also I agree, because usually for the pain we give a cocktail of drugs. Uh, I think that also we should, we should also contemplate some therapy for depression, which could also have a positive impact on pain in the MQ patient. Now, I want to just to summarize the uh, CNS imaging, and I refer mainly to this uh, paper which has been published very recently, this a German paper. I want just to show uh, what we can see by uh, conventional MRI in a brain MRI in a patient with a DMQ. You can see uh, by this uh, arrow, white arrow, we can see some uh, white matter hyperintense lesion with the usually are periventricular or subcortical. But uh, I, I doesn't mean made a lot of study because usually when, uh, when we investigate the M1, we investigate also the M2. So I try to summarize the main alteration described. First of all, in the M2, it has been described a global atrophy, a ventricular enlargement, an alteration of the white matter hyperintense uh, region, but also some uh, uh, alteration in the cortical thickness uh, regarding all the lobes, frontal, temporal, and also some white matter reduction regarding the corpus callosum, the cerebellum, and the subcortical area in all lobes. And if we uh, employ some sophisticated techniques like DTI, we can also uh, see an alteration of the association of fibers uh, uh, in the brain. And if we look at to the functional uh, alteration, uh, in the M2, it has been uh, shown an alteration of the flory, uh, the soft glucose, mainly in the frontal and temporal lobes. Uh, we, uh, we, um, we have shown a reduction of the cerebral blood flow, uh, mainly in the frontal, orbitofrontal, parietal cortex, and by MRI spectroscopy, it has been, uh, it has been shown an alteration of the uh, um, N-acetyl aspartate. And by ultrasound, it has been an hypoechogenicity to brainstem or an hyperechogenicity to substantia nigra and an increase the white of the third ventricle. But in my opinion, uh, I think because uh, I think that the future uh, imaging studies, uh, they should, uh, uh, it's very important to establish some procedure to facilitate uh, compatibility across different studies. In other words, uh, I think that it's very important to do some multi-center study, but with the same uh, protocol. 
the alteration should be investigated by a multimodal approach and it's very important to use some sophisticated techniques like uh, brain MRI at 3 Tesla, DTI, and are very important to do to design some longitudinal study to understand if the white matter or gray matter alteration are a consequence of the developmental disturbances or, ne or neurodegeneration. For instance, we know from this idea, also from some workshop uh, which uh, we had in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Europe, but also with, uh, also with some uh, consensus where we had uh, with the Myotonic Foundation. We know that uh, regarding the DM1, we think that the, there is a, a development and disturbance regarding the congenital and the child form, and there may be neurodegeneration in DM1, in, in the adult form. But we no, but because we don't uh, we don't have longitudinal study for the M2, we cannot answer to this question, which is very important. And of course, the uh, we uh, we it's important to link functional or structural brain alteration to cognitive impairment, just to facilitate the development of biomarker for the upcoming therapeutic studies. Now, I want to just to tell you the experience, the Milan experience, uh, the coping with the COVID-19 and the DM2, the experience that which, which we had in Milan. Uh, and this experience is also following the guideline of the World Master Society. Uh, at the moment, there is a considerable variation in the in the way uh, of the the national restriction uh, regarding uh, for people with DM2. But I want just to uh, to stratify what is our experience uh, that I will distinguish DM2 patients uh, at low risk, which means no cardiorespiratory involvement, no. They don't take uh, uh, immunosuppressant drugs. There is uh, no significant risk elevating factors, no com comorbidity. We would suggest uh, following a local and the national guidance and in doubt consultation with a neuromuscular specialist. For patients with the medium risk, which means uh, mild respiratory involvement, we advise a detailed discussion with the neuromuscular specialist and the controlled the relaxation of restriction strictly in a secure environment may be considered, but always take in, in account local and the national re recommendation. It's different for patients with high or very high risk, which means with a severe respiratory involvement, for instance, a uh, uh, forced vitalis capacity less than 60%, patients who are at home uh, with a ventilation, where there is a relevant impairment of heart function, a patient taking immunosuppressant drugs or have a severe weakness, weakness. For these patients, measures of self isolation to avoid infection should remain in place and the carriers and the family members must continue to use the mask and the barriers when in contact with the person at risk. But patients need to be reassured that they can safely attend uh, after the lockdown for important procedures like we are now at the moment in Milan, uh, procedure as a sleep studies, a cardiac test, and non-invasive ventilation. So uh, the neuromuscular specialist needed to monitor their patient court and after the post and after the lockdown they can arrange for safety for service uh, in a safe uh, uh, area that's very important especially for instance in my hospital we have an area covid related but we have also 
area non-COVID related, um, where there are uh, safe waiting area, consulting rooms with appropriate distancing between patient and staff. Now I will talk about research. This is very important because we are a very exciting moment. I want just to refer to this uh, review that I did with uh, uh, Dr. Genevieve Gourdon uh, uh, regarding the, uh, the new therapeutic development for the CNS. First of all, uh, uh, as you can see, it is very complex, the myotonic dystrophy. I have no time to go in detail, but I want just to say that the myotonic, the, the pathomolecular mechanism in the M2 is similar to the M1. Also, there are some differences. You can see uh, here the muscle, the heart, and the brain, and how many genes are involved but if you, you look at to the right, you can see that we have a possible entry for therapy. We can uh, entry and we can uh, work at DNA level, RNA, to the mediator or to the targets. So we need to have, but for instance, for the new therapeutic development in CNS, in the M2, we need to have a proof of concept where we can use drugs, uh, antisense oligonucleotides, and also gene therapy. And in my opinion, are very important the cells, the cells just to give you an idea uh, the, regarding the embryonic cells, the iPS cells or the um, neural stem cells. You can see these cells, these cells are all, the same cells are also for the M2. So the same features of the M1 are uh, really a similar for the M2. I want just to show where we have a different kind of cells, fibroblast, myoblast, differentiated mast cells, stem cells, cardiac neural cells. And in these cells, we can have a lot of information regarding foci, which is a pathological hallmark, the muscle bind co-localization. Muscle bind is a protein uh, very important in the pathomolecular mechanism in the M1, the M2. We can see in all these cells a splicing the misregulation. Of course, we have uh, a tissue specificity for the muscle, for the differentiated muscles, and for uh, uh, the heart, for the cardiac cells, and for the brain, for neuronal cells. But we can also, which is very important, we can uh, study the proliferation, and we can easily manipulate uh, these drugs in, in the lab. But you can see in these models of the M1, but the same is also for the M2 patients, just to give you an idea where from the, uh, from the healthy old patients, we can take the myoblast, usually we take from the uh, muscle biopsy, we can uh, proliferate the cells, we can differentiate in the myotubes, but also from the skin, we can have the fibroblast, and also we can transform them by myoD in myotubes, or we can, by using these uh, iPS cells, we can differentiate in neuronal cells, cardiac cells, and also other cell types. But the same from the blastocyst, we can take the embryonic cells. So this is a very important in um, uh, just uh, regarding the, the research, because for the proof of concept. I want also to show this, uh, this is an important paper. Uh, this is a collaborative paper where uh, at the European level, where also I participate, just to show you uh, the importance of some proteins like RBFOX1 and muscle blind. 
which show competition with the uh, CCUG RNA repeats and contributes to the myotonic dystrophy type 1, type 2 difference. As you can see, this is the M1, where you have a master blind titration. There is a, a, this titration of, uh, of master blinds where the master blind is uh, entrapped by the COG. This determines an alteration of the splicing at uh, cellular process, and the splicing misregulation determines almost many, many symptoms in the M1. We see what happens in the M2. The M2, you can see that we have the tetraplex, and this, uh, there is a milder, a muscle binding titration by this uh, RB Fox. So the milder uh, muscle binding titration, which means a milder entrapment in foci of the muscle blind, this determines a milder splicing misregulation, and this could and this explain the milder symptom. So you can see the difference between the M1 and the M2. But also we have also some research about the sleep disorder in myotonic dystrophy. You can see how the, how the excessive daytime sleepness fatigue uh, are related to the central nervous system, but also to muscle. And you can see that we have some proteins which are misplaced um, uh, at the neuron level, like the tau, but also some other proteins which are also misplaced. And of course, the same is for the M1, but also for the M2. So I want just to give you some care recommendation. This is on the basis of this a uh, very collaborative paper where I had the honor to participate with some colleagues from the United States and also from Europe, where I want just to emphasize some point regarding the consensus which was just made with the help of the Myotonic Foundation. And regarding the pain, uh, I said before that the muscle pain is a big uh, issue and the statin induced myopathy is often accompanied, accompanied by muscle pain. We don't, we have just a cocktail to treat the pain. Uh, it's important to avoid opioid because we, if implemented, we, sh we should close and monitor the side effects regarding the op opioid. But also there are also other remedies like massage, nerve block, chiropractic. And but for the full recommendation, we can see at myotonic or clinical resource. Regarding the neuropsychiatric symptom, I want to just emphasize that the M2, the M2 is also a brain disorder that can involve cognitive deficits and change in the cognition over time. We should include psychiatric and the behavior examination and the baseline and during regularly scheduled follow-up appointments or when symptoms appear. And I refer patients with a psychiatric or behavior disorder and patients with a cognitive complaint to mental health care professional. Uh, we could treat with a psychostimulant if apathy is associated with impairing level of fatigue or, a, or excessive daytime sleepness or antidepressant medication. But in that case, we should do a cardiac examination before starting the treatment. And for the excessive daytime sleepness, also very rare in the M2, we should uh, prescribe a sleep study. We should uh, refer to pneumologists and sleep specialists if EDS scores are positive on scales. Regarding a uh, question of patient regarding uh, alcohol or caffeine consumption, medication, and um, evaluate effect of possible respiratory muscle weakness. And 
if there is a nocturnal or daytime a hyperventilation, consider non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. It's also important to consider modafinil for treatment if there is a coexisting TNS alteration as a cause of ADS. Finally, I want just to say the take home message of my presentation. I want just to remind you that the Italian uh, foundation of the FMM, Fondazione Mattia Metonica, where I am the president of this foundation, there is also in Italy an alert card. And in this card, uh, this card is dealing with the, the recommendation regarding, regarding surgery, anesthesia, pain, regarding the cardiac complicants, uh, the respiratory complicants, the obstetric and the gynecology complicants, the GI complicants, and also the weakness. So just as a take-home message, I want to just finish that myotonic dystrophy type 2 is a complex multisystemic disorder that is currently managed with the supportive care to address of a multitude of skeletal muscle, cardiac, endocrine, and the CNS symptoms, among other effects of the disease. There is still much work to be done to understand the symptom burden and the effect of the disease on the patient's lives, as well as to reduce this burden. There are exciting developments in a research to identify potential therapeutic targets that, if engaged, should result in improved disease phenotype. But the biggest challenge appears to be the design of therapeutics that can reach the tissue such as visceral organs, cardiac, skeletal muscle, and CNS. The discovery and the refinement of sensitive stratifying pharmacodynamic and therapeutic efficacy biomarkers with a allow rapid clinical trial implementation. There is an ongoing need for biomarkers that can demonstrate target engagement and the early therapeutic response in inaccessible tissue, such as the central nervous system, as the disease effect in this tissue represents a major source of disease and the symptom burden. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. So uh, I want also to uh, answer to some questions which arrived from the uh, DMQ community. And uh, uh, the first question was, uh, is there anything <clears throat> we can do to slow the cognitive impact and the progression of the disease? My answer, at the moment, we cannot envisage any effective medical treatment to slow the progression of the disease. And on the basis of the M1 patient's experience, by making use of the cognitive reserve, as has been shown, in the optimistic study in 2018, also from one paper in, uh, two years ago, we could stimulate a proper, through a proper uh, neuro uh, rehabilitation program, and offer psychological support. And the rehabilitation protocol with focus on uh, attention, praxis, executive function, while on the, uh, on the psychological side enhances the disease awareness and the patient's coping strategy. Question number two. What is the incidence of dementia and Alzheimer's disease in the MCP? Well, I have just said, first of all, that we don't have Alzheimer, it's just in my presentation, but uh, uh, according to my experience, uh, is not known the incidence of dementia uh, uh, and Alzheimer, 
So it's not, it has not been reported for the lack of clinical and the pathology study. But we should also refer to some paper from Germany where we refer some clinical symptoms from three families, but were very unspecific and were not consistent and included mental, mental changes with hypersomnia, Parkinsonian features, stroke-like episodes and seizures. But in my in opinion, there is no dementia, no Alzheimer in the M2. Question number three, what is the incidence of anxiety and depression in the M2 patients? In our uh, small experience, we did not find anxiety and depression, but in a more recent report, and I'm sure that it, it, there is a present, it has been reported in the M2, anxiety in 32% versus 61% in the M1, and depression 7% in the M2 in comparison to 13% in the M1. Question number four. I definitely feel a few steps lower than before I started having the M2 physical symptoms. Memory, inability to plan, finding words, difficulty concentrating, and the mental fogginess are my cognitive difficulties that all appear at the same time as my physical symptoms three years ago. It has been quite a shock for someone who had always been regarded as one of the smartest people in any room. Do the cognitive difficulty generally tend to worsen faster or slower than the physical problems? Well, I said before in my presentation, there are really very few longitudinal studies. Regarding the M2, there is only one study which I showed in our study, which but it was limited to only 11 DM2 patients over seven years, we demonstrated a selective frontal lobe function involvement regarding the attention activity and demonstrate, I won't say again over time, that there is no progression to additional area of cognition, and there is no progressive interference in activity daily, daily living as in patients with dementia. Regarding the muscle strength, the decline was evident in the M2, also less in comparison to the, M1, to the M1. We don't have enough data on the natural history studies on the M2 related to muscle and the cognitive aspect, but I presume that the cognitive difficulty tend to be slower than the physical problem. Question number five. I had been on mexiletin and gabapentin for pain for two years before I felt the, the gabapentin was not helping or controlling the pain anymore. I switched to amitriptyline for the pain. That switch also helped remove a good portion of my cognitive difficulty. Are there any other drugs or drug classes I should avoid exacerbating the defensive functioning? I say I should, you should avoid the anticholinergic drugs, which you know, like Aftane, which is known to interfere with the cognitive functioning in general. Question number six. Can you comment on the relative prevalence and the impact of excessive daytime sleepiness in the M2 as compared to the M1. Also, can you comment on the assessment of fatigue in these patients in contrast and distinct from sleepiness? Is the fatigue primary neuromuscular or related to mental fatigue? ADS is very common in, the, in myotonic dystrophy and it can occur before onset of muscle symptoms. Symptoms of ADS overlap with the mental crowding, fatigue, and apathy. And if we look at to the literature, ADS is found in about 40% in the M2 in comparison to 50-80% in the M1. 
But what is the ADS? ADS refers to inability to stay awake in situation that require wakefulness. Fatigue indicates a sense of exhaustion with a decreased capacity for physical and mental work, and it may be also related to reducing the cognitive reserve needed for sustained action. Fatigue and ADS should be considered together. But there are no data in literature if fatigue is primarily related to neuromuscular or TNS effects. And the question number, uh, number seven. Can cognitive issues be secondary in that they are possibly related to, the unusual, to either the unusual prevalence of insulin resistance in DM2, diabetes type 3 impacts cognition, or fogginess in autoimmunity, multiple papers on the autoimmunity in DM2 literature? My personal sense is, is that my ability to focus and concentrate is not permanent ongoing one but appear to be more episodic. The episode seems somehow related to the presence of fatigue in general, or often accompanies other symptoms. Can you please comment if this is or is not noted in most recent medical studies? So we have shown an abnormal insulin resistance and signaling alteration in skeletal muscle both in DM1 and DM2, because I had one uh, uh, PhD student who did uh, sponsored by the uh, Myotonic Foundation, uh, who uh, did the uh, uh, research about the insulin resistance, both in DM1 and DM2. So we know the, this topic. We know that in DM1, the abnormal insulin resistance could be related to apathy, visual, spatial, and the verbal memory deficit. Brain insulin resistance is also related to depressive disorders and obsessive compulsive personality traits in DM1. We can, but we can translate all these findings to DM2. There are some papers on, uh, on uh, autoimmunity and DM2. In a, there, this it is present in 21% in DM2. But this paper related to anecdotal cases. And it, is, and it seems that there is uh, no relationship to cognitive deficit. Question number eight. As someone diagnosed with DM2, I would like an update uh, on the research into possible therapeutics for DM2 and the possible timing to begin human trials and approval. I would also like to know the same of potential score. As shown in my presentation, there are many progress in patomolecular mechanism. We have a lot of uh, uh, tools to investigate, which could be uh, a road map for a possible human trials for a potential school. And I feel very positive that we should have the, some human trial also uh, in the uh, MQ. Question number nine, does anticipation occur in the M2 or in the M1? The answer very easy. No anticipation, no anticipation occur in the M2. It occurs only in the M1. Question number 10. Is there a link between the M2 and autoimmune condition like Hashimoto thyroiditis? Yes. Case report have shown the coexistence of the M2 and the autoimmune disease. And besides uh, uh, Hashimoto thyroiditis has been also shown uh, myasthenia gravis, multiple sclerosis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, giant cell arthritis, uh, chronic immune thrombocytopenia, autoimmune chronic arthritis, uh, and the grave disease and the celiac disease. So uh, a lot of autoimmune disease. Question number 11. Is there a link between DM2 and disorders? 
Yes, there is a link between the M2 and the mood disorders as shown in my presentation. Is there a link between question 12? Link between the M2 and deafness? Yes, there is a link between the M2 and deafness as shown in several papers, and the deafness has been described also in the M1. Question number 15. Is there a link between the M2 and the hyperkalemic periodic paralysis? The answer is no. There is no link between the M2 and the hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. But just uh, well shown in some paper, describing that both chloride and the sodium channel could be a modifier genes on the M2, determining an early on to the severe myotonia in some patients. And according to this paper, I want to emphasize that, uh, that if we have a severe myotonia, we should look at an early onset chambers. And this is very important because practically we can give to this patient also the mexiletine, which, is, uh, which, is, uh, which works very nicely in controlling uh, myotonia. Question number 14, if, if this link exists, why do doctors in the field not know about that? Well, in my opinion, even if I'm interested in this disease from a long time, the M2, prom, the M2 also called also PROM, mainly in Germany they call PROM, like prostate mitral myopathy, but we call the M2 in Italy, is still an uh, under-recognized disease also for specialists in neuromuscular disease. This is the reason why the doctors then do not know. So we need, in my opinion, to do more education uh, with, uh, with the papers, a webinar like I did the, today, um, this afternoon, for this condition as is the end. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mayola. Yeah, I hope it was clear, yeah? Yes, it was great. Lots of great information. And thank you so much for doing those questions at the end. That was really helpful. Thank you very much, Leah.